very much, everybody. Um, it's an honor to be here. I want to thank the Temple University and also the Harvard Club of Japan for organizing this event. And I want to thank uh, Tomo especially uh, for, 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 for making this uh, event happen. I want to show you a very short video first uh, that captures the, the fundamentals of what we do at Copernicus. Uh, my parents are pretty domestic, 
Um, they never lived abroad. Um, they raised me in Japan until I graduated from university. Um, but I was quite fascinated by this, this scale and the, and, the, and the global nature of, of the work. Um, and 10 years later, I actually ended up working for the United Nations. I was, I was quite, um, quite uh, determined to, to join the UN and uh, I, I was really calculating the, the fastest way. How can I join this organization in, in the shortest possible way? And uh, I went to uh, study in, in the UK and then immediately started sending the application for the internship and of course rejections. Uh, but I uh, just kept trying and trying and then finally got the first internship opportunity at the UNHCR when I was at, when I just became 24. And um, um, so that was the beginning of my, my UN career. And then I, I had some stints uh, in, the, in the consulting firm uh, afterwards. But uh, most of my career was with the United Nations. Um, so I, I, I was in, uh, in Timor-Leste. Uh, immediately after the restoration of independence in May 2002. And I stayed there for two years. Um, and then I was sent to uh, Indonesia uh, just after the uh, devastating earthquake and tsunami in Aceh and North Sumatra. And then I really wanted to um, feel the, the meaning of poverty, real extreme poverty. So I really um, I tried to, to, to get the position in Africa. And then I ended up going to Sierra Leone, uh, which was then the poorest country in the world. Um, based on the UN's um, Human Development Index uh, that was available, the Sierra Le Leone was a 178th country out of the 178 countries assessed. So um, it was a quite a good um, learning uh, experience for me in Sierra Leone, really see what the extreme poverty looks like and really think about what the UN can do and what I can do within the UN to solve these massive uh, problems. <coughs> and then I, I went to the headquarters, I was working on the UN reform, I've, se I've seen many agencies working on the same issues. And so I, I, I had a chance to really uh, work on streaming, streamlining the uh, roles and responsibilities uh, among the uh, United Nations agencies and then also to, to coordinate the actions in, in the country. Uh, <clears throat> the, I really enjoyed every moment at the UN, but I was beginning to um, think that maybe there's, a, there's different ways of, of doing business. There are two things that was really beginning to bother me. First is that it's, the UN is, is quite a closed community. Um, UN works with the donor, donors, which is basically the diplomat in the, in the embassies. In, a, in any given country, and also working with the uh, civil servants in the government of the recipient countries. So these three actors, UN, donors, diplomats, <coughs> and the civil servants in the government, often meet and then decide on how the, the uh, problems in, the, in, the, in their countries uh, should be resolved. And as you can imagine, if you get this government head, three uh, uh, bureaucrats head together, you can expect that not much interesting and creative ideas will come up. And that was really the case. You, it just, you seem to be doing the same things over and over again for 20 or 30 years and really didn't see much impact on the ground. So this, 
really the close nature and the lack of sort of new ideas and creative uh, ideas. That was, uh, was beginning to bother me. And second thing was that UN is an intergovernmental organization, after all. So the UN works closely with the government. And the assumption is that if you support and strengthen the government in the developing countries, then these governments will deliver activities, actions that basically help eliminate poverty. But that was the assumption. But there was a huge gap between the thinking and the actual impact on the ground. So we've seen a lot of training activities, we've, we've seen a lot of policy development at the capital level. But if you see the ordinary people's day-to-day -day lives, there's a huge gap. And despite all the money that is being pumped into these countries, we didn't, I personally didn't see much impact on the ground at the level of ordinary people. So um, that was when I, uh, I was in, in Sierra Leone. I started to think, OK, so this is a problem. And what can I do? What can I do to address this? What can I do to bring new ideas into this aid industry? And the first idea was, uh, was quite different from, uh, from Copernic. So this is a reality TV series um, called Poverty Eliminator. Uh, so this was uh, the, well, actually, this is like a 20 page uh, um, a concept for the TV reality TV series. And this was really based on the idea of the apprentice. Who, who knows that the apprentice? The Donald Trump, you were, you were fired. <laughs> yeah. So I was quite fascinated uh, by, by that program. Um, so for, for those who don't know the apprentice, this basically um, so you have, uh, let's say, ten, two groups, uh, each comprised of, let's say, ten people, two groups, and um, members of this group is, comes from very different backgrounds. So be, for, uh, the civil servants, doctors, business entrepreneurs, uh, school teachers, they, they get these different people, uh, the people with different backgrounds together, and create a two teeth. And then he, they compete for the best business solutions. So the Donald, Donald Trump comes and say, you know, oh, you have to come up with a new uh, TV advertisement, 20, 20 seconds, and you have to sell this new product. And each of them compete. And at least after listening to the, 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 uh, the executive from this company, they will create a TV ad. And an executive of this company will judge who wins. And then the losing group will lose one person, and then and then this continues next time, is another challenge. And so that was basically the idea. And then I was quite fascinated because they really discuss different ideas. And the people with different backgrounds comes up with, okay, maybe this TV TV ad should be this. Maybe we should use that. That maybe we, we should uh, think about this angle. And it's it's really a, a great a dynamic uh, process to come up with one one product a solution. And I think this is quite normal in in, in, in many businesses. But I just didn't see this uh, lively brainstorming and and, uh, and and discussions in coming up with ways to uh, 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 the approaches to for the poverty reduction process. So if we have this kind of series and ask them very specific poverty related questions, for example, we have this particular village um, has a high prevalence of malaria. And this is how the village looks like. And each group will come up with new ideas. OK, so let's get rid, rid of this water. Um, or, OK, so let's bring this uh, mosquito net and then do A, B, C, D, E around this. 
and the village people would basically judge which one would be the most suitable, the most suitable. And then you go to the next round, let's say a women's participation in the local uh, decision making. How can we increase women's participation? And people in this group will come up with different solutions. And so, so on and so forth. So, by introducing this, and then we get really people from different backgrounds on TV, they discuss. And I thought this was quite a, a different approach from what was happening at the, the, the UN and aid industry. Um, so we had, we drafted this, and then sent to uh, a lot of TV companies. I have no idea how this, this industry worked. And uh, no response whatsoever. I think that we, we sent to, to many, uh, many companies, really the cold emails. And spoke to several friends in the TV industry in Japan, and they said, well, you need a million, million dollars to start this. I said, okay. Um, maybe I need to think about a, a different one. And I said, okay, so let's forget about the TV industry. I'll do it on YouTube. And so it's the same idea. So anybody in the village can post a challenge in their village. Again, it's uh, the school attendance, um, or oh, malaria prevalence, and anybody can propose a solution. And it can be voted by the, by the village people. And so that was the, the, the version two of this uh, poverty, poverty solution. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so I was like quite excited, and then was talking to many people, and then, okay, I want to make this happen to really bring different uh, thinking and dynamism into, into the, the aid industry. Um, but I, and then I get stuck because of the first thing. So the, the, the basic assumption of this model is that local organizations or people in the village can articulate what their needs are. And this is quite difficult. If you ask any ordinary people in the village, say, what do you need? They say, oh, I need a car. Oh, I need TV. Um, so this, if you can articulate the problem, it's, you know, you're already one step towards solving it. So this was a huge, uh, huge uh, bottleneck in making this. Uh, uh, online version of uh, reality TV. So I got stuck. And, um, and then, okay, I thought maybe I should think about a completely different thing. And, and then I was still thinking about uh, different ways. And um, so I was in Sierra Leone. So I basically I, I gave up on this, on, the first, on, on this first and second idea. And I was still thinking. And by the way, when I was in Sierra Leone, I used to go to this uh, local um, uh, shop. And so every Sunday, I was really looking forward to going down the hill where I live, to the beach side, and then buy the, the very fresh fish, lobsters, snappers, crabs, and then um, go home, and, uh, and then my wife will keep cook sushi and, uh, and have a, a misoshiru out of the crab and, and that was a, that was a quite, quite an enjoyable time. And, but we were noticing that these, the way they sell fish, they just put the, the fish in the bucket and uh, by the time it's around noon, the, the fish start to smell. And, and they, they can't sell it anymore. So he said, uh, why don't we bring this, this uh, ice box <laughs> to them and then teach them how to use it. And uh, you know, then they can continue to sell this fish in the afternoon and make more income. And uh, they can help their own families. And so <laughs> we, 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 we basically bought around six ice boxes and then went to, went to them and said, hey, look, I think if you use this, um, you can expand your business. And they're like, oh, yes, 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 yes. 
<laughs> after a few weeks, we found out that one of these uh, women just took six, all of them, and then using at home. And so these, as a group, they were not, not using this uh, ice box at all. So that uh, this project failed. Um, but this was um, an interesting moment for us. So these very simple and small inputs could make a huge impact if you get other things right. So we started to think about, okay, so if we, we can bring this really simple but impactful technology, and if, they, if we come up with this, the, the ways, the, the system in which they, keep, they continue to use, then I think we have solved some uh, uh, interesting problem, problems. And so that's when we started to um, learn about many simple technologies that are specifically designed to, to serve the poor segments in the developing countries. For example, very simple solar light that replaces the need for kerosene light. So 20% um, of the population on the planet are relying on kerosene because they have no electricity. And basically they burn kerosene, which produces very dim light, a lot of smoke, and this kerosene is very, very expensive. If we bring solar light, which they can charge during the day, and have very bright light at night, with no running cost, no smoke, we will have a huge impact. And water, 3,000 children die every day because they lack access to clean water. And if we bring very simple water filtration device, so this one is it's a combination of two buckets, and then there's a filter in between. And you put the water from, let's say, the river on the top. With the gravity, it goes through the, this filter. When the water reaches the bottom bucket, it's safe to drink. So it's quite simple. And I thought it was quite good. And cooking. This is how people typically cook in the rural area, in the developing countries. Again, they don't have, uh, have access to gas or a cleaner means of cooking. So they just uh, burn firewood, uh, firewood. They have to collect firewood first, dry it, and then burn it like this, to cook rice, to cook vegetables, to boil water. So quite reliant on this uh, way of, uh, of cooking. But again, you need to go out and collect a lot of firewood, which is typically a women's job, and you need to cook. And exposed to this harmful smoke coming out of cooking with the firewood. And by the way, the, the UN estimate that there is uh, two million people die every year because of the smoke coming out of uh, the, the, the firewood and uh, caused by the, the indoor air pollution. And there is a very simple solution as well. And this is called clean cook stove, which uses much less uh, firewood and because the combustion is so efficient, it doesn't produce smoke. So you, you're solving the, the, the critical issues around cooking. Um, this is a, yeah. another one. So the maize, one of the major staples in the developing countries, and you, you can see on the, on the left that women uh, shell corn using fingers, one by one. It's, it's a quite tedious process. And we found this bicycle-powered conchella, and you just put it, and then instantly, you can shell the, the entire corn. 
uh, which will save a lot of time for, for, for women. So the, we were redefining a lot of very simple yet impactful technologies for the poor. And, and we spoke to all these companies that is manufacturing these great technologies and everybody said that it is about distribution. We cannot get these products to where they are mostly needed. So after talking to these companies, brainstorming and learning from the, 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 the failure of the Icebox project, um, we came up with this model which basically connects three different groups. One is the manufacturers of the technology, mostly startup companies, and local organizations. It's typically NGOs, women's group, savings and loans group, or uh, cooperatives, and then funders. So we showcase these products. We have uh, nearly 70 uh, technologies in energy, water sanitation, agriculture, education, health, and local organizations who understand the needs in their own communities says we will need this cook stove, for example, and we will need 50 cook stove, and we will raise funds to purchase and ship these products from the companies, manufacturers, to the local organizations. And local organizations, they will then basically create a distribution mechanism. They sell these technologies. Um, and then some of the revenues will come back to us, and we will reinvest this money to the next project. So this is how we, it works. And uh, if you look at this, let's say the bottom one, this is to bring the solar light to Uganda. And you see that there's, a, there's a, a square at the bottom, and 7761. So that's a required funding to purchase, I think this is probably 300 units of the solar light. And anybody can donate through online. So they can purchase a, an equivalent of bringing one solar light, or they can pinch in any amount, $5. Um, and when this small uh, donation reaches the required amount, we can start a project. Um, so this is how we fundraise um, through the website, crowdfunding. And uh, we also have a lot of corporate partners who often finance the entire project. So these are the combinations of, of the funding sources that we have. And we focus on really in remote area, uh, so we, what we call the last mile. So this is a, a distribution day that I accompany in, in the poorest province of Timor-Leste, East Timor. Um, so, um, so this is our local partner, and they were, we were on the way to the village across uh, this river. And, um, you can see that there's no bridge, so we had to literally walk um, uh, by foot. And uh, the, <laughs> the challenging thing was that was, this was just the beginning of the, the rainy season. And uh, the, 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 the water level was, was going up. And uh, so this was when we were just about to reach the village across the river. And the local people were saying that you have to come back really early, otherwise you can't cross, go back. Um, but it just took <laughs> so long. And uh, by the time we finished, it was already dark. And um, the water level was up to here. And uh, quite dark, and we, we discussed what to do. Should we stay on this side? Uh, but there's no place to stay. Or should we cross this river? And uh, um, we, we asked the local people and they said, we will, we will uh, hold your arms from both sides and then you take off your shoes and put everything on your head and go. 
Uh, so we, we agreed to do that, and then um, because it was so dark, we, and then there was somebody who had a car on this side and was uh, uh, turning the light on, and you can see also on the other side of the river, there was another car waiting with a light. Uh, so we had some, some uh, 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 visibility. And we went one step uh, slowly, and uh, it took us one hour to get there, but we were uh, all alive. Um, so this was a, a, an extreme example, but uh, these are the, the kind of place that we typically work at uh, the, the last mile. And uh, since we started about four years ago, we have reached uh, about uh, 140 thousand people with these very simple um, life-changing technologies. And the biggest project portfolio is in Indonesia and Timor Leste. And in Indonesia because our head headquarters are in Indonesia and I, I live in Indonesia. And Timor Leste, which is next door, so it's quite, quite um, uh, it's easier to do projects in these locations and have a lot, a, a lot of close communications and, an, and a deeper um, engagement with our local partners. But we also have had a lot of projects outside, including Kenya, Uganda, Nigeria, Vietnam, India. And at the moment, uh, we are implementing projects in the Philippines. You can see that on the, on the top side, this is a phase five of the a project for the uh, survivors uh, of the Philippine typhoon. Um, so we brought first the water filtration and that was quite well received and then uh, we heard about the need for the, the light and this light also charges a mobile phone so we, we decided to launch this uh, follow-on project and then now we have a phase five. And you see that also in Japan, after the, the earthquake in, in Tohoku, um, there was a similar request to us. They said, well, you guys are working for the, uh, the developing countries, but there is a need for energy, there is a need for light. So we basically use the same mechanism to deliver over 2,000 uh, solar lights to the affected area. Now, um, so when we started, it was the technologies were introduced through the website. So the local organizations who have had access to the internet were able to find us and were able to request uh, the technologies. But we thought that only targeting a small number of uh, local organizations. So we started the, this technology fair where we physically bring uh, a number of technologies to the communities and uh, make a demo, demo in front of them. And they can ask questions, they can play with it, they can try it. And at the end of this technology fair, um, the communities will collectively decide which one they will need the most. And then that's how the, the project starts. And we take this approach quite uh, extens extensively in Indonesia, Timor Leste, and uh, Tomo just uh, did uh, this technology fair in, uh, in Myanmar. So we found this quite, quite, uh, quite a, a useful way of really finding out what is the need in, 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 this, uh, in their own communities. So now the local partners will have the technologies really without any risk, right? Because it's brought to them with the philanthropic funding. Now they have this product, but the idea is for them to sell. So this, well, we started uh, this tech agents program where we train the group of women. Most of our local partners are women, women's group. Um, I think it's because the water or cooking, these are day-to-day -day chore of women. So they will see immediately the benefit of these technologies. So 
they are the one who, who uh, protest that. So these tech agents will go around their village, sometimes door to door, sometimes holding a small village level meeting, and introduce these products like her and, and sell it. And they earn income for each sale they make. And, and then the, they will also pay us back only after they sell these products. And we, we, we reuse this funding to kickstart the next distribution project. So this is uh, uh, some of the, the women's group that are selling these technologies. And so you see the cook stove and the water filter in uh, different locations in Indonesia. And so this is the, uh, uh, the training. So because they sell and they need to keep track of their, their sales figures, so we, we provide very basic financial training as well in this process. And, and when we did the, uh, a small survey, uh, what these uh, women's women agents uh, gained through this process, their sales skills, communication skills, knowledge in technologies, water filter, solar lines, entrepreneurship, financial skills. So some of these the, the findings um, after the, the training. And also even you know, we go to very remote um, areas. Um, and initially they, they, they didn't have any, any sort of kind of material. Uh, but now we have developed uh, this uh, catalog and then order form so that it makes uh, the, the, uh, the process much easier for, for, for our uh, partner uh, on the ground. And so basically we started to work with NGOs and then we found out that many of them are actually women's group and we started to really work closely with the women's group and so that was quite good but uh, there was one thing that I, I wanted to test which is converting this kind of rural shops into a technology kiosk so this if you have trouble to in a rural area in India, Indonesia, Myanmar. This is where people uh, buy things, the day-to-day -day things. They buy coffee, they buy sugar, cigarette, water sometimes, um, soft drinks. So, and and um, the uh, the recent study uh, by McKinsey said that this in Indonesia, this kind of retail. Uh, accounts for 85% of the retail market in, in, in Indonesia. So, if you can actually distribute stuff through here, you can really reach the last mile. Uh, so, um, this was the idea, the kiosk. And uh, so this was basically, this, the idea was two years ago, and um, we were talking to a number of uh, corporations for uh, for the funding, and uh, we were we got lucky. So we started to test this first tech kiosk. This this small shop was selling only around five <coughs> products initially, and then really uh, run down and run by these two uh, this couple, um, and they have a daughter, and then the they really wanted to increase the sales, but they just didn't know how to do it. So we found, we just stopped by and said, you know, to started to talk, chat with them. And we actually visited over 100 of these uh, uh, warrens, it's called warrens in Indonesia. And uh, just to, to understand how, how the business works. And then also say, if uh, we can provide this kind of service, would you like to join a kiosk network? And actually 10% of them said yes. And we, we selected most eager uh, shop owners, and this was uh, one of them. And uh, so we renovated these shops a bit, 
Uh, in fact, we, we overdid it, so you should surprise, be surprised. <laughs> uh, so we did this. Uh, so there's a logo which is quite different in the rural area, and uh, it's also designed the furniture, and um, you see these already, the, the water filtration and uh, solar lights are being sold. And uh, the, this kiosk itself is also um, run by a solar light. And so it also basically uh, transmits the, the message that you can live with a, with, a, with, a, with a clean energy. And these shops actually increase their sales by between 20 to 30 uh, percent because they have a wider range of products and it looks different so people come. Uh, so this is one of the, um, this was the first tech kiosk that we established and now we have uh, over 30 uh, tech kiosks uh, in Indonesia concentrated in here in uh, East Nusa Tenggara uh, which is one of the po poorest uh, provinces in Indonesia but we also have in other areas. So I, I have a short video that shows how we recruit and how we work with them. Um, so 
with this combination of uh, the crowdfunding and um, corporate or institutional funding, we are basically running the organization. And uh, I'm gonna, uh, and then also some uh, uh, advisory support provided uh, on a pro bono basis. And you see that we have quite a lot of uh, university partners, and we uh, work with them to conduct a lot of uh, impact assessment. And I think these are the so. Yeah. so it's one thing to bring these products to the end users, and that is very, very important, and that's quite hard. But we want to make sure that these products are having an intended impact. So we have been conducting a, a number of um, assessments, and uh, so you see that uh, this is again from Okusi in Timor Leste. So the on average, household was spending about fourteen dollars per month just to purchase kerosene for lighting, and fourteen dollars was about twenty percent of the monthly expend expenditure. So it's quite a big uh, proportion. And after the introduction of the solar light, the expense dropped ninety-four percent. So virtually spending no money on kerosene. Some were still using kerosene, so they were still, this is not zero. So, and when we ask how this saved money we used, they were saying they either buy rice, they buy vegetables, they buy textbook for children, or they send uh, the, the sick father to clinics. So you see that there's a lot of other effects just by bringing very simple solar light. And also the, how they spend time at night changes uh, because it's much brighter and no smoke. Um, so this is uh, so household saying that I am doing more income generating activities. And income generating activities in these contexts means uh, <coughs> weaving uh, a basket uh, or the material or mat, and they can sell on the next day the market. So just the light, providing light have a lot of multiple impact and we have conducted a number of, of those studies um, with our uh, university and uh, research partners. And so that are sort of the, the overview, so how you know, the, the, the patterns in the expenditure and how they spend time at night, so these are the things that we looked at in depth with, with these assessment. But we also ask them to rate these technologies and this is um, something that I'm really, really keen and uh, want to expand uh, uh, quite a lot. So, like Amazon, right? So if, if you want to buy a book, I would, I would go to Amazon.com and, and see what other people said about the book. And then the star rating, and if it's higher, you have a higher expectation of this book will be a worthwhile reading. And I want to create something very similar. So the better products should be promoted, and bad products shouldn't be promoted. So I want to get this feedback and then put it public. So we asked, we were asking these questions to the end users, and uh, some are very, very positive, and some are and not positive, and this is sort of in the, in the gray zone. This is a very fuel efficient bookstore, which this is one of my favorite technologies. And uh, when we started to ask this question, how do you rate this technology on a, on a scale of one to five stars? We got the average, rate, average uh, uh, ordinary uh, uh, sort of three star rating. And uh, so we asked why? Well, this is so fuel efficient. If you do the test in the lab, this always comes up as a, up, up as a top. But they said, you know, you need to chop this wood into smaller pieces. And this is an additional work. And the, the, the one of the value propositions of the clean cook stove is that because you use less wood, you don't spend time collecting fire. So there's some time saving. But 
because I need to add another workload of chopping wood to use this, um, there was no time saved. And the chopping of wood was considered to be the women, uh, men's job. So the user of the cook stove were mostly women. And so they need to convince their husband to, to cut the, the, the firewood. And uh, you can imagine uh, many didn't succeed. Um, so, and then they stopped using this all together. And then we provide this feedback to the, the manufacturers of the, this clean stove. And he created this different model where you don't have to, to, to chop the wood. And there's many other uh, variations in terms of uh, this cook stove. So this feedback uh, we found was not only useful for the future users, but also for the manufacturers of this technology. And then we put in all these comments and star rating on the website, trying to look like Amazon, but not quite. Um, but we just want the future users to know when the local organizations express interest, they can see what other organizations said and other users said about water filter, uh, solar lights. Um, yeah. And um, we also started to use uh, a mobile phone. So going to the really remote areas and then visiting the household one by one, asking questions, is really time consuming, expensive, and it's, it's not really time. And, uh, but one of, typically, one of the family members have a mobile phone, the most simple mobile phone, there's, there's no, no smartphone, it's just really simple. Uh, uh, one, uh, but we can ask questions. Can you rate this technology? One, two, three, four, five, and we, we do get the response. So we we get in this process much more real time, and uh, and then and easier. And so, based on this experience, we we launched a new new project led by Tomo. Uh, he drafted the, the, all the ideas. Uh, basically, so there are a lot of new technologies coming up to help organizations like us to collect information. So we call this uh, impact tracker technology. And uh, we put the, if we collect this uh, list, we basically gather all these impact tracker technologies in one place and then make a list. And the idea is, is also to help disseminate this impact tracker technologies using our model. So one of them, it's, it's, this is a, a survey app uh, developed by a Grameen Foundation. So rather than the paper base, you can use the, the app uh, on the smartphone and uh, the data will be automatically uh, collated and then once you, you go back to where the internet is, you have already, already the charts and graphs. And this one is, uh, uh, is uh, developed by a Portland State University. Um, and this is the GPS enabled sensor attached on top of the cook stove. So you can monitor on a real time basis when the cook stove is being used because it, it detects the heat and how much CO it's emitting. And there's a website that basically tracks all these things. So, okay, so this family is indeed using this cook stove three times a day, and this family stopped using it. But we will see actually when it's, it's being used. And this is also similar technology. This one is, is that it, it tracks the temperature and whereabout of the vaccination. So vac vaccine need to be kept under a certain temperature. And uh, so this, keeps track of the temperature and where it is. So this helps the delivery of vaccines to where they're needed. So another, so you know, based on this model of distributing these technologies, we started to look at the impact trackers. And then also we got, uh, we were approached by many companies. So, right. You guys are in Indonesia, which is the emerging market or, or the big DOP market. And uh, you guys are selling products and you guys are getting feedback. Why don't you 
uh, give us a, 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 an advice for our product. Do you think this product will, will work in the rural area in Indonesia? Um, so you were constantly getting this kind of request. So we started this uh, consulting. And one of the, the clients was uh, Vanessa. So Vanessa, you can see the, the, the largest irrigation companies in Japan and the second or third largest in the world. And they have a great educational toys uh, as part of the Shinken Zemi. And these are the very simple microscopes. This is a, a game, like a multiplication practice uh, machine, uh, a telescope, and this is, I think, for the addition, for the multiplication. And uh, uh, sometimes comparing the, uh, the performance using these educational toys vis-a-vis -vis the group which did not use the educational toys and compare. So <clears throat> this kind of, um, sort of uh, product testing services we started to provide, and then Tomo is doing quite a lot of these. And um, so when we, had, we were doing this with the companies, and the aid agencies started to express interest. So uh, my old employee, em, employer, UN, uh, said, you know, UN is also under pressure. We need to change how we, how we work. Can you come and help us think about new ways of doing programming? That was uh, uh, Armenia. The World Bank approached us saying that we want to share uh, the open up and more information about the World Bank. How much money they are spending on which project um, to the communities that they work with. But they don't have, obviously, access to the internet, so what kind of technology can work? Is it radio? Is it mobile? Or is it more face-to-face? -face? So we did that, that kind of testing with the World Bank. And uh, we're starting with a, new, uh, with a GIZ, which is the equivalent of JICA in Germany, uh, to map uh, inclusive business in Indonesia. So uh, quite a lot of... Um, so once we started this consulting and research work, it is expanding uh, quite a lot. And uh, because we think that our approach is unique, combining the philanthropic and the business approaches, uh, Tom wrote this article, and uh, we started to talk about this a year ago. And uh, it was recently published a month ago on the Stanford Social Innovation uh, Review. So we talked about using the particular uh, case study of a project in East Java in Indonesia and then talked about this, the balancing, uh, the, the importance of balancing the philanthropic and the business approach. So we, our core work really remains with the distribution. We need to get this amazing product to, to, to the last mile. Um, but through the feedback collection and through this working with the companies like Vanessa or many others, we are also supporting the companies to come up with better technologies for the poor. So that's part of the uh, consulting service. And we are now also working with aid agencies which manages huge amount of money and and trying to bring in different approaches in in their day-to-day -day activities so uh, we started with this and this continues to be the main focus but it is sort of expanding um, our, our scope of work has, has expanded uh, considerably so who is behind this so this is some of the team, uh, we have Tomo here and then Hiromi on the other edge. Uh, but the uh, majority of our team is in Indonesia, uh, quite from uh, really different countries. And now we have, we counted the other day, we have 40 uh, people in the team. So it's much larger than, than when 
when this uh, photo was taken. Um, so quite international team uh, behind it. And uh, so we found it, actually. So we are the founders. This is my wife. We met in Jakarta in 2005. We both worked for the UN, we were colleagues at UNDP. And um, both at the time quite into the UN, really uh, happy. But then we started to talk about what can we do? We see the gap, what can we do to fill this gap? And um, when we started, uh, we found out that uh, my wife was pregnant. And uh, that was immediately after I, I told my uh, boss that I will leave the UN. So um, at some, um, some uh, difficult uh, dilemma of stability versus a startup. Um, but uh, I, I think the, the decision to, to leave the UN and then putting everything into this organization was the right thing. And because we, we cannot fail this, we really are um, doing this seriously. And uh, so after work, we go home, still talk about the work. Um, but uh, I think uh, this is probably some of the, 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 the reasons why we're still alive and then gradually um, uh, growing. So that's basically about it. And I just want to, to tell you two, uh, to give you two announcements. One is on Thursday this week, on the 5th of December, there will be an event, annual event, called Copernic Forum. This is basically, uh, we, we uh, give an update of what's happening recently, but also have a, a panel discussion uh, with our, some of our corporate partners. We have a Cisco Systems CEO speaking, and uh, we have a guest from Dial Securities, a guest from uh, Japan Airlines, and guests from Yahoo Japan, and uh, uh, Ms. Kumi Fujisawa-san. And uh, we have a panel discussion, that's the second part two. It will be held at the Midtown in Ropongi, 21st floor, from 7 p.m. on the 5th of December. And this will be in Japanese, so um, please, if you're interested, please join. And uh, finally, we have a Facebook page, uh, we have uh, a lot of regular updates on what's going on at Copernic. So please join if you are interested. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so we'll um, take uh, questions. Um, we'll take three questions at a time to sort of expedite the Q&A process. If you can uh, briefly introduce yourself and then ask uh, your question. That Thank you very much for your time. Um, I am Joy, and I work here in Tokyo with, an, with another MPO as well. And I have a burning question, actually, as you were going through your presentation. Um, first, I'm really happy to hear of a process of scale. I think MPOs battle that that ability to create change on a on scale, and so I'm really happy to hear this. And um, the other uh, the question that I have for you is with regards to gender. Um, I hear uh, throughout your conversations about how women are the ones that are approaching you or how the technology is being used by women. Um, and in your marketing materials and in your photos, it's little girls reading by a light and I wonder about her education. Um, and so I see this happening and what my question is, when you say you're the last mile, what I hear is the first step into sort of lifting up a community onto you know, the first step in liberating themselves out of poverty, and with that comes social change. And so I'm wondering where you are. How do you feel about this in terms of are you ready for it? And are you also laying the groundwork for the social change that can come when new technology is introduced into a community? Um, I'm guessing in terms of uh, girls' education, women's participation in politics, um, women's rights in terms of country, like are, 
do you see this road? Are you prepared to engage in that dialogue? And where do you see yourself in that social fabric? Thank you. Okay. Uh, next question, please. Anyone? Yes. interest uh, social group and business. Uh, I want to study about um, um, your business. Um, but I think uh, it's too difficult uh, to join UN or Lebanon for billet. Uh, how do I uh, study about Social development business. Please tell me your opinion. Thank you. Okay, we have one question. Hi, uh, Toshio Sudo, business person. So, my question is yeah, your activity, I really respect your activity and quite uh, uh, insightful. Uh, today's business presentation, I really love it. And uh, I assume, or I guess, there is a paradox that uh, when we look at the society where the te technology is uh, most needed, like the, uh, the progress society or the place where women's uh, rights are uh, limited, uh, there will be a kind of mental barrier or culture barrier to accept the, the your technology. So how did you, uh, let's say, uh, evangelize? How did you uh, make the first, the, the, the first, first, real first step to open their uh, door? Uh, thank you. Uh, when, when you said scale, probably um, you haven't seen our financials, so. <laughs> but uh, it, it's not that, that big yet. It's still small, um, but, uh, but uh, we are quite encouraged uh, by the growth of the organization. Um, so where do we see? Uh, so there are a lot of things that we want to address just by bringing simple technologies. Um, but uh, causation is a, is is we is something that we need to be careful about. Um, what we are now looking at is more direct changes that these technologies brings. And when you say the woman's right, woman's participation, which I think is a, is a good thing in itself. But if we say that by bringing the solar light. We are also helping them uh, to participate in decision making more. Um, that linkage, um, uh, we can't really say. So we're basically still limiting to the more direct effect. And then this is helping this XYZ. And hopefully this will uh, lead to a larger uh, societal change. Um, but uh, at this point, um, we haven't made that analysis yet, and um, also there are many other people doing great work, even public schools, right? It's their teachers working hard, and maybe it's due to that. Right? So, um, uh, so I, I don't know if I am answering your questions, but uh, uh, what we want to make sure is that these simple technologies will have at least very immediate impact that we talked about, changes in the, in, the, in, the, in the expenditure patterns, how they spend time, how women spend time collecting firewood, and that will hopefully lead to a bigger, bigger change. Um, the second, uh, right, so you, uh, you want to start? Study about social businesses in developing countries. I think the best, best thing is to go <laughs> <laughs> to the country otherwise. You can't read. Maybe you can read while while waiting, but the best way is to, is to go and experience it. And I think that's nothing is better than that. And the uh, third question was about the the that the 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 first step. Right. So so the first step often comes from the local organizations. So let's say take an example of 
uh, one organization is called BECA uh, in Indonesia, which started about 10 years ago um, by a group of widows. So they lost their husband, uh, and um, so they, they got together and then started to support each other. And within 10 years, they spread to, I think now by 19 provinces in Indonesia, and quite a huge membership. And they do so many things like advocating for women's rights, uh, training women for uh, small businesses, uh, savings and loans group, all sort of activities. And they are the ones who saw the technology and said, right, this should work. So they, they found us. And working with them, we conducted the technology fair. So we were able to reach out to the community members uh, around where, I think, where they work. And then they said, OK, right, this looks very interesting and promising. So we want to buy. Great. Uh, any other questions? If you'd rather uh, ask in Japanese, that's fine too. We'll handle Thank you. Um, uh, I saw recently the uh, um, Gates Foundation very active in sponsoring all sorts of different projects and the uh, listing of various uh, innovations that uh, some of the um, projects have been put together <coughs> and uh, a lot of the uh, products have got their distribution. And it's a key issue of this of distribution that they also allude to. Uh, getting great ideas and really involve enhance people's lives and bring, bring about poverty and education. Um, and they seem to be also uh, faced with frustration of distribution. How can you can you can you like compare perhaps how your model for distribution might work and how other models might work in a different way um, from comparisons? Uh, yeah. My question is related to the previous question. Do you turn on your mic? Um, my question is related to the previous one about um, culture values. Uh, when you bring new technologies, sometimes that forces the local community to change the way they do business together with the way they uh, organize the people there. Uh, two examples you demonstrated actually fascinated me. Two really examples. One was about the uh, CUDA books. Though the technology was great, one person dominated the entire box, therefore all your, your project fell. The second one was about the stove. Though women want to introduce the stove, but men want to work extra hours. Therefore, the question is, when you bring new technologies, that might actually uh, uh, incur some changes in society. How can you help them uh, restructure the way they do business? Good question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Mitch. Um, I'm uh, researcher in university. And uh, uh, my question is, uh, how uh, you, you mentioned there are several uh, example of how uh, this NPO actually work with uh, university. And uh, uh, could you actually share an example of how we started and uh, what kind of uh, product that we need to, if there are any, uh, especially uh, if there are any successful uh, or you know, if there are any failure or anything. Thank you. Thank you. On the distribution, I, I think so. The Gates Foundation, as you know, focuses on the on the health, and uh, which is a huge, huge challenge in, in itself. And then um, this is something that we haven't really worked, uh, but want to in the future. Um, and health, health is uh, is seems to be quite a a, a, a special field. Um, I felt, uh, so when I was talking to my friend who was working at the World Bank and then trying to improve the health delivery system, 
in Nigeria, uh, uh, Kenya. And the basic assumption is the government, right? So you, you basically strengthen the government uh, system to deliver medicines and health services. Uh, whereas cook stoves, which is this, this, this nobody distributing cook stoves, and it's, we were tapping on on you know, small entrepreneurs and local shops. So the question that the, the discussion we had was, can we apply this model to the health service? Can we distribute medicine or other health services by working with uh, small local NGOs, uh, cooperatives, or small shops? And we haven't done it. <laughs> but I think that that can be possible. And there's an organization called Living Goods um, very strong in Uganda, and uh, they started as a health uh, distribution service, and uh, not that the coverage is not that big, but uh, their model seems to work. So it's very similar. They recruit women and then go to household by household and sell medicines, fortified food, sometimes soap, uh, because they they need the fast selling products to keep the business going. So they combine this fast selling uh, products uh, and health related uh, model. And I think that, that, that seems to be working. So, and I, I remember Melinda Gates was talking about the, the new uh, the health delivery system. And when she started her pre presentation, she said, Coca-Cola. How can Coca-Cola reach the, the end of the world Whereas the medical products don't, and I, so I think this, you know, using this kind of local shop net network or women's entrepreneur or any entrepreneurship uh, uh, based uh, distribution, that may work, and then maybe we need to deal with the regulation issues as well. Cultural barriers. Cultural uh, uh, barriers. Yes. Um, uh, I, I, I think there's no easy answer. I think um, if uh, so, this Pekka, um group they they don't have husband, um, uh, so they 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 I, I saw women actually chopping wood sometimes. Uh, so that's also they they went over they they went beyond the traditional thinking that cutting wood should be done. By men, not by women. So we we've, we've seen that that example. And then of course some some men are cooperative, right? <laughs> and uh, but what we do is we really convey the benefit of using these technologies. And uh, we also explain in a group context. We train women. And uh, um, yeah, I mean I, I I hope that is that is also helping. The, the men and women to, to adapt these new technologies. And university partnerships, maybe one on product development, another on rapid impact. So the successful partnership, um, so the assessment we have done quite a lot. Uh, so Columbia University, SIPA, they came twice to Indonesia. They spent uh, a month on the ground and uh, collected a lot of user feedback, assessed the, the changes. Um, with MIT now, what we are doing is to evaluate these technologies technically. So let's say uh, solar light. Is this, when it rains, will it still continue to function? And <laughs> so literally like 10 lights under the shower uh, and the showers, the, the, the amount of water was controlled by the, so they, they did the research, and in Uganda, <laughs> this, uh, it rains this much. And so they put this light uh, for three hours, and then see how, how which, which one uh, actually worked after that. And then, so this kind of technical testing we are doing with, with, with MIT, and that's, that's quite useful, I think, and uh, quite successful. Um, Product development. Um, so we're working with a number of companies. Um, 
we, we can't talk about it because uh, we have a confidentiality agreement. But there are a lot of uh, big companies that everybody knows here uh, who are interested in, in this rural market, uh, who have some already very concrete ideas, some of them have prototypes, and uh, going through a number of stages. And uh, I hope our, by working with, with us, uh, we are ac helping them accelerate this uh, product development stage. Great. Any other questions? Oh. Thank you very much for the speech. Um, <coughs> when you say you deliver technology, I'm assuming that you deliver actual goods, am I correct? Um, so let's say if it's a stove, I would imagine that distribution cost is, is huge, you know, shipping, trucking, and insurance maybe, and I find <laughs> no insurance. I would imagine that a lot of products might be broken. Oh, there's a warranty, so the company can replace. Anyway, um, and and I find it a pity that much of the fun to go to is cost rather than to manufacturers or to local organizations. And I'm just curious what you think about that, and if you have any, any ideas of like doing OEM or something to create more options. To make this more available locally. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Takashi Yoshimura. Uh, I'm a CEO of Social Venture Cloud. This is uh, my company. Recently, I found it. Uh, the question is: uh, I'd like to ask question in Japanese because of my limited uh, command of Japanese.
Um, so quite uh, a lot of uh, technologies are actually coming from uh, these, uh, these countries. Um, so, um, um, and then we were trying to find the equivalent technologies in the country that we, we work. So let's say if we, if somebody requests a cook stove from Indonesia, in India, we say, well, look, there's, a, there's another equivalent version of cook stove made in India. So why don't you try that? And then, so that, 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 that this, there's a, a, this, uh, this kind of discussion. Um, on the second point, on the waste, that keeps me away. And uh, we've been really uh, asking everybody, and <laughs> I want to ask you as well, for ideas. I've seen a very interesting um, tool uh, that doesn't use any electricity. Uh, basically, you uh, break the, 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 the plastic into smaller pieces, and then generate heat with a bicycle, and make a, a, a thread uh, out of the, the, the plastics. And you can use that to create chairs. So basically, you can recycle the, the plastic waste into something else and create something new. Um, that's something that I'm looking for. And affordable, uh, decentralized recycling tool for the rural area. And uh, if you know anything, please let me know. I've seen that typically it's done in a big city. So um, collect and with some companies ship it to Surabaya in the case of Indonesia. It's very far and they have a large factory to recycle and something else. So you need typically a huge investment in a big, big facility. But I am pretty sure that it can be done on a decentralized level. And uh, please uh, let me know if you, if you have the answer. And the last question was, How do you, which technology oh, yes, yeah. go to where? Yeah. So it's basically we respond to the demand. So there's a demand. We we'll look at these organizations. We check the reference, and uh, and also we will see how these local organizations interact with us. If they don't respond for a month, we're not going to work with them because it's likely that we don't get report from them. So we basically screen a lot of uh, organizations out of this uh, process. Once we are confident that this organization is good enough, then we will post the project. Basically, all the projects are posted. And it depends on the funding, how quickly it's, it's funded. If it's funded, we'll start a project. If not, we'll stay there. So, Okay, we'll take a uh, couple last questions and then we'll uh, finish up. So maybe, perfect. Well, thank you so much for creating this beautiful business. It's very inspiring. Um, I like to create my own NPO next year and I just wondering, um, because your headquarter is in Indonesia, and um, creating this type of business in Japan is kind of difficult, you think? I mean, what I'd like to know is to, to get the funding from the corporation or to get um, um, some new business idea from the corporation. might be easier to create this type of business outside of Japan. Oh, okay. 
um, sometimes there are local technology already existing on the field. And um, I was just wondering what you think about uh, your new product, maybe as a replacement or as a competition, or is it uh, you know, another product in the market on the local side? And whether you consider any potential for local products or technologies or even ingredients that's possibly on the ground to be feeded back to the corporations that produce your products. Um, as maybe a potential business partner um, for more uh, of those type of markets that's not been found previously until you guys came in. Or Any uh, One last question. Maybe two. Two last questions. Um, thank you very much. It's very inspiring, and the, uh, this shows us kind of a new idea for the new social business model uh, in the 21st century. Uh, that's one of the reasons I brought up my students here, the high school students. I just wanted to inspire them with a new idea. Um, after hearing your presentation, I kind of felt that the uh, your business model is very much based on the local. Uh, if you consider the, uh, the last mile idea, to reach the last mile, uh, many companies must be looking at that kind of action. But in the meantime, what I felt was that, uh, let's take a look at India. Uh, it's a huge market, and a lot of, lots of people, and remote villages are a lot. Uh, it may be difficult uh, for a lot of organizations uh, to coordinate and organize such activities in all over the world, like India. Um, I was kind of wondering if you're interested in cooperating or uh, partnering with other organizations that may take similar approach uh, so that you can multiply your idea and this model to other like, markets. So that's my question. Okay, one last question. I'm Rick Weisberg. I'm a, an ecologist running a scientific editing translation company. Thank you very much for creating this wonderful organization and sharing the story with us. I guess one of the big problems with the standard model is the inefficiency of the, of, the, of the transferring resources where they're needed. And I'm wondering, um, it, at, at all different steps along your process, you know, both if we start with the distribution to the people who need it, can you, uh, how do you prevent theft and corruption? And on the donor end, I mean, are you tax deductible in Japan and the United States? What, what can you do to increase the efficiency of transfer of resources where they're needed? Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you. Let's tackle this uh, location issue. There's, there's pros and cons, of course. If, uh, so when we founded this organization, we were in New York. We were still at the UN. And um, we made a decision to move to Indonesia because it's much cheaper. <laughs> my stable income stopped, so I had to I had to really save uh, and control my, my spending uh, for myself and for the organization. And two, we were just starting, and we had this idea of connecting the local partners, and then, but we just didn't know. We had to be there and see how it works, and uh, it's still we still like tweaking the, the different uh, uh, small bits in the distribution model. Um, so it's, it's never ending. And the best way is to, to be close, learn as you go, and um, be ready to respond as quickly as possible. Uh, so that's the reason why we decided to, to be in Indonesia. But uh, there are other opinions. Um, like we had a huge discussion with the board that we should be in New York. That's where the money is, and uh, you need money to grow. Why, why, why did you guys move to Indonesia? <laughs> and uh, our justification argument was always that we need to make sure that this model works. Without the model, money is nothing. And, uh, and I, I think, to me, that, that's, uh, that's uh, 
that's the right approach. Um, so we will be in Indonesia, but uh, it doesn't mean that we we don't have to be in Japan or US, or Australia or Europe. We have a uh, we have Hiromi there sitting over there. She is uh, based in Tokyo. Uh, she spent 200 percent of her time uh, talking to companies um, and raising funds. Um, so you need that function. You definitely need that function. Um, but uh, I think to me, in the first year, it's better to be closer to the production. And if you have the right model.